What up space fam goes in here from anime uproar back at it again to discuss all 20 titan shifters and their powers explained about three years ago I went through all nine titans of LD and their powers but it's about time for an updated version that takes into account all of the new things we've learned since then and all of the new titan shifters that have been introduced if you do enjoy seeing these attack on titan videos and want to keep them coming then the best thing you could do is warhammer smash that like button to let me know really destroy it if you haven't be sure to subscribe and this is crucial hit that notification bell and select all or you will miss future attack on titan videos if you haven't subscribed yet make this the day you subscribe and while you wait for the next new video to drop feel free to check out our growing attack on titan playlist where we got videos about all the ackermans and their powers the titans rank from weakest to strongest and much more link to that is in the description now without further ado let's jump into it spoilers and all as you may well know by now emir fritz was the founder Founding Titan, and we'll address her specifically later on in this video, but for now all you have to know is that she possessed all of the Titan powers. Emir died 13 years after inheriting her Titan powers, and eventually they were split into 9 different Titan powers. These included the Founding Titan, the Colossal Titan, the Armored Titan, the Attack Titan, the Female Titan, the Jaw Titan, the Beast Titan, the Cart Titan, and the Warhammer Titan. The last Titan to be revealed in the story. Now let's jump into each Titan power and their known shifters. It makes sense to start with Emir Fritz, the Founding Titan, the girl who started it all. For a long time people viewed her as either being a devil, which was the view from the Marleyan perspective, or as being a goddess, which was the view from the Eldian Restorationist's perspective. As Aaron Kruger would go on to mention, neither of these extremes seemed very believable. And he was right, as Aaron would later tell Emir Fritz, she's no god just a person. And Emir was just a person. She was a slave of the Eldian King long ago, about 2000 years ago. She wasn't born with Titan powers, but got them one strange day when she was running for her life, because she let a pig get away. While people were hunting her down and she even had multiple arrows inside of her, she stumbled upon a massive strange looking tree. She entered it and fell down into the water below. It was at this point that a spine shaped creature attached itself to Emir's own spine. And this explains why, as Rod Reese explains, the power of the titans is inherited by biting through a human spine and ingesting their spinal fluid. After the spine-shaped creature attached and combined with the mirror, that was when she transformed into the first ever titan. As a titan shifter, the king could see her potential and decided to keep her and use her newfound power for himself. Even though Emir could absolutely destroy the king if she wanted to, she had internalized a slave mentality and obeyed the royal family's wishes. She used the power of the titans to build roads, cultivate the wastelands, make bridges between the mountains, and defeat enemy nations like the people of Marley. Within the span of 13 years after inheriting the power of the titans, she went on to give birth to three daughters fathered by the king of Eldia. She died when she took a flying spear in place of the king, and while everyone expected her to get up and heal as usual, she didn't. Her daughters Maria, Rose, and Sheena ate her body so that the king of Eldia could continue to use the power of the titans. On his deathbed, the king told his daughters to give birth and multiply so the blood of Emir never dies out. Thus, the subjects of Emir which includes most of our main characters, are called that because they possess her blood, which had been passed on through the generations. Only those with her blood can become titans. Because Emir died after 13 years of inheriting the power of the titans and she was the strongest ever titan shifter, it is said that no other titan shifter can ever hope to live beyond the 13 year mark. This is known as Emir's curse. However, Emir didn't just die. She went on to a mysterious unknown land where the paths that connect all subjects of Emir are visible. From this unknown land that subjects of Emir can sometimes enter or catch glimpses of, Emir continues to slave away. She molded the special earth there into titans and that's actually how titan transformations and regeneration come about in the real world. It is noteworthy that this dimension transcends time and works in a way completely different to how time works in the real world. The founding titan is known as the coordinate because that is where all the paths, which are connected to all subjects of Emir, converge. Royal blooded Eldians who had the founding titan power could gain access to this unknown land of paths and give orders to Emir and thus long after death, Emir would continue to work away tirelessly as a slave of the royal family. Obviously since all of the nine titans 
come from a mirror and are simply fragments of her power, it is logical that she could use every single Titan power that we're going to discuss in this video. But the Founding Titan specifically can communicate with all subjects of Emir, no matter the distance, change the body compositions of subjects of Emir, alter their memories, create countless colossal titans, use them to create giant walls, and then release those titans on the world. And don't fall for the idea that all the titans are created equal, because the Founding Titan is by far the most OP, since it lets you straight up control the other 8 titans if you wish to. Most recently, Emir was able to summon past users of the 9 titans and launch them at Reiner, Mikasa, Levi, and the rest. They had no choice but to retreat when they got the chance. As we know, this Titan power was passed on through the royal family. Eventually, it came to Karl Fritz, the 145th King of Eldia and the first King of the Walls. The dude was sick of the horrors, fighting, and destruction that he witnessed, and decided to let the Eldian Empire collapse. He peaced out to the island where our main story begins with some of his people. He built the walls using colossal titans and rewrote everyone's memories inside the walls, so that they thought they were the last remnants of humanity. Notably, certain groups like the Ackermans were not affected by this memory manipulation. While most founding Titan users inherit the lost memories of mankind, King Fritz also made sure that future royal blooded users would inherit his pacifist ideology. This meant that, like Carl, they would not use their powers to fight back against the Titans or against the rest of the world when they finally came to wipe out the island. The royal family secretly changed their name from Fritz to Reese, and the founding Titan power continued to be passed down. Eventually it was inherited by Rod Rees and Yuri Rees's father. Although the royal blooded inheritors after Carl possessed the same power in theory, they were much weaker in practice because Carl's will kept them from fully using the power. So when his sons begged him to free humanity within the walls from the titans, father Rees refused and never revealed why. Eventually the founding titan was passed on to Yuri Rees, who as mentioned wanted to free humanity within the walls from the titans before he inherited the power. However, he inherited Carl's philosophy and changed his mind about destroying the Titans just like his father before him. Yuri also became Kenny Ackerman's best friend after he made the latter feel completely powerless by using a partial Titan transformation in order to grab hold of him and trap him. Kenny and Rod viewed Yuri as a god because of his vast knowledge and immense power. Eventually, Yuri passed on the power to Frida Reese, his niece, and Rod Reese's daughter. Frida would visit her half-sister Historia and then proceed to erase her memories after their meetings using the Founding Titan power. She was inexperienced though and so actually managed to lose in a Titan battle against Grisha's attack Titan, pretty shocking outcome considering the potential of the Founding Titan. Grisha, because he was not royal blooded, could not use the Founding Titan power, but at the same time, at least he wasn't affected by King Carl's ideology. He let himself be eaten by his son Aaron, and thus Aaron inherited the Founding Titan and the Attack Titan from his father. Of course, he too wasn't royal blooded, so the Founding Titan power remained largely dormant inside of him. There were exceptions, like when he made contact with Dina Fritz's royal blooded Titan, and then managed to command the surrounding mindless Titans. The key to using the founding titan while avoiding the restrictions of the king's ideology seemed to involve a non-royal blooded user coming into contact with a royal blooded titan. Eventually Aaron made contact with Zeke, his half brother and Dina Fritz's royal blooded son, and gained control over his founding titan powers. After convincing Emir Fritz in the unknown lands that she didn't have to be a slave to the royal family anymore. From that point on, Aaron's had practically limitless power. Not only could he control the other titan shifters like Armin and Reiner, if he really wanted to, he can even, through Emir Fritz, summon titan shifters of the past and use their powers. As if unleashing countless colossal titans to flatten the entire world wasn't OP enough, Eren unleashes Bertolt's colossal titan, past warhammer titans, a beast titan that looks like a reindeer, an armored titan that looks like the thing from the Fantastic Four, and many more. They come out of his giant skeletal frame that towers over colossal titans in size, and at this point Mikasa, Levi, Reiner, and everybody present knows that they have to retreat using Falco's flying titan because this kind of battle is unwinnable. I think people reasonably assumed that Eren would have to absorb the other titans to use their powers, but the last chapter has clearly shown that not all titan powers are created equal, and the founding titan, if it wishes, can do just about 
without anything. Next, let's move on to the colossal Titan Power. Before Eren fully unlocked the Founding Titan Power and entered his giant Godzilla skeletal form, the colossal Titan seemed to be the biggest of the nine powers. Compared to Frida Reese's Founding Titan, which was about 13 meters tall, the colossal Titan is 60 meters tall. And there's a reason the colossal Titan was called the God of Destruction by Marley, because compared to most of the others, the destruction it can cause is, for lack of a better term, colossal, albeit nowhere near as colossal as the amount of destruction that Eren can cause and has caused recently. The Colossal Titan has three main distinguishing features when compared to the others. Its size, its ability to produce a strong and hot steam that can prevent others from coming too close to its body, and most notably its ability to create massive explosions. Its massive size may mean it's slower than most, and the user can transform less often and for shorter periods of time, but it's also stronger, allowing the user to destroy the gates of the walls with just one simple kick. The steam it can give off burnt Armin to a crisp, and if Bertolt didn't stop using this ability, Eren wouldn't have had the chance to get close to his nape. However, the drawback is that the more you use this ability, the thinner the Titan's body gets, because it is burning through itself. Ultimately, if used too much, this ability will completely burn through the Titan body, leaving the user vulnerable. And then there's the explosive transformation, which is the only possible power that Armin and the rest thought could maybe let them compete with or beat Eren. However, Armin is caught before he could transform, and thus we don't know if it would actually significantly slow down down Godzilla Eren or not. Still though, the fact that they put so much faith into this ability shows how much everyone respects its devastating power. If the user wishes to, his Titan transformation is accompanied by a nuclear-like explosion that destroys anything in its path, while creating a giant mushroom cloud. Armin used this ability to devastate Marley's navy fleet. Not a bad opening act. If you're watching this, you know that Bertolt was the first known user of the Colossal Titan, and then the ability was passed on to Armin. Armin was on his deathbed and the only possible way to save his life was to turn him into a titan shifter because of their regeneration powers. The fact that he also got all of the other colossal titan powers was a bonus. Although Bertolt's colossal titan and Armin's colossal titan have distinguishing physical features when compared to each other, especially around the face area, it appears that they have all of the same powers. We don't know yet if Armin possesses any abilities that Bertolt didn't, but we also haven't seen a lot of Armin's colossal titan in action, so it's possible if unlikely, that he has some unique ace up his sleeve. Notably, Armin did inherit Bertolt's memories and sees visions of him from time to time. It definitely seems like he inherited Bertolt's crush on Annie, or at least Bertolt's presence in his body seemed to amplify Armin's own feelings towards Annie. But enough about Titan love, let's move on to the Armored Titan. The Armored Titan has become a bit of a joke at this point, and I'll explain why. It is about the size of most mid-range Titan shifters at 15 meters tall. It's distinguishing feature is its armor. While most Titan shifters can use hardening in one way or another, the hardening doesn't usually cover their entire bodies as it does with the armored Titan. It seemed cool at the beginning. In theory, its full body armor would serve to strengthen its defense and offense. Cannons and other Titan punches wouldn't do much damage, while a charging armored Titan possessed enough strength to break through the gates of the walls. The drawback is that the armor makes the armored Titan slower. Armor can be shed to increase speed, but it comes at the price of lowering defense. The armored Titan was respected as Marley's shield, a symbol of its indestructible power. However, the problem was, Reiner kept losing and the shield kept getting destroyed. We see that Z can easily destroy Reiner's armor off screen. Eren destroys it through wrestling and then through hardened Titan fists. Then a nation devises anti-Titan artillery that can destroy it too. So it's come to the point where the armor kind of just seems to slow Reiner down without giving the benefit of indestructibility that it was initially supposed to give. Notably, the armor can protect against the Colossal Titan's explosion ability, which is cool, but that just makes me think that the Founding Titan would be okay against the explosion ability too. And speaking of the Founding Titan, it can also strip the armored Titan of its armor whenever it wants to as 
as well. I know there are big Armored Titan fans out there, and believe me, I'm honestly not trying to hate on the Armored Titan power, but it truly seems like it's become less and less useful as the story's gone on. Next, let's look at the Attack Titan. The Attack Titan is perhaps more hype than any other Titan, simply because it lends its name to the title of the series. In Japanese, the Attack Titan and the title of Attack on Titan are spelled the same way, so clearly this power is especially significant. The Attack Titan is another 15 meter tall Titan. The first known inheritor of the Attack Titan, Aaron Kruger aka the Owl, said and I quote, in every era the Attack Titan has always moved ahead seeking freedom. It has fought on for freedom, end quote. As far as the Attack Titan's distinguishing abilities go, I'd break them down into three main manga strengths that make it pretty special and one anime only ability. One of the Attack Titan's distinguishing abilities is its incredible strength compared to its body size. This increased strength makes it ideal for attacking. After he drank the bottle labeled armor, Eren's Attack Titan could harden its fists and use them to break through the Armor Titan's armor, pretty much making the armor useless. Eren's Attack Titan could also lift a giant boulder, even giant for a titan, and carry it all the way to the wall to plug a hole, while Eren Kruger in turn lifted and destroyed a giant Marleyan ship in his titan form. Another notable attack titan feature appears to be endurance, which again goes with the idea of attacking and always moving forward that is associated with this titan. In Marley, Eren transforms into a titan three times and is fighting and exerting himself all the while. Porco is shocked when he sees the third transformation. Despite transforming into a titan first, he's also the last titan standing. The two features I just mentioned are notable compared to some of the other titans, but there are titans like the Colossal Titan who are stronger, and Titans like the Cart Titan who have better endurance. This final power that I'm about to mention, as far as we know, is completely unique to the Attack Titan. Of course, I'm speaking about the Attack Titan user's ability to see the memories of future users. This is why Eren Kruger mentions Mikasa and Armin before they're even born. Grisha explains this insane ability when talking to the Reese family, before taking the Founding Titan power. First he says, and I quote, From long ago, the inheritor of the Attack Titan never obeyed others. It's been all to resist the self-righteousness of the king." End quote. Then, he goes on to say that the Attack Titan is capable of knowing the future through its future inheritors. It was actually through this ability that Eren sent specific memories to Grisha in order to push him to take the Founding Titan so Eren could inherit it. And as I explained in my Eren's Final Titan Explained video, past Eren could even see future Eren's memories when past Eren inherited Grisha's memories of future Eren. Aaron's memories. You can go back and replay that sentence if you need to, but the main takeaway is that the Attack Titan, as Zeke says, has the power to transcend time and affect the past by showing memories to past users that serve the future user best. Then finally, there's the anime-only Berserk or Rage mode, or whatever else you want to call it. In the anime, Aaron's Titan's eyes start to glow blue, his Titan body is surrounded by flames and lava-like veins, and he seems to gain power and speed, which allow him to to defeat the female titan that was beating him before the berserk transformation. This could just be an anime only form which will never come up again, but it does seem to go along with the idea of the attack titan and always moving forward. Because when Eren seemingly lost consciousness, his titan body kept attacking and moving forward on its own. We'll see as the story wraps up if this form ever shows itself again, but for now it just seems like an anime only change done to make this specific battle more hype and intense for the season finale. There were three known users of the Attack Titan. First there was Eren Kruger. He worked for Marley and pretended to be loyal to them, but was actually an Eldian spy known as the Owl, who eventually passed on his power to Grisha when his 13 years were almost up. Kruger, as mentioned, transformed into the Attack Titan and used it to lift and destroy a giant Marleyan ship. He killed the Marleyan soldiers present before passing on the power. Grisha took the power and used it to make it to the Outer Wall alive. He eventually met Carla and had a son. He seemingly named his son Eren in honor of Eren Kruger. Grisha's version of the Attack Titan notably had a beard and was strong enough to take out Frida Reese's founding Titan, which is supposed to be the strongest of the nine Titan powers. However, Frida was inexperienced and 
and as Grisha mentioned, her powers were limited because of Karl Fritz's ideology. Finally, after gaining the founding titan power, Grisha turned his son into a titan and let himself be devoured. Thus, our protagonist Aaron Yeager became the holder of both the attack and founding titan. Next, let's turn to the female titan and there is only one known user of this titan power so far and that of course is Annie Leonhardt. Marley explains to us that the female titan is an all-purpose unit capable in every area. In addition to high mobility and endurance, the titan's hardening abilities combined with Annie's martial arts abilities make for an incredibly destructive force. The female titan is also able to summon pure titans, though her range is limited. And by summon, they simply mean that with a scream, the female titan can attract surrounding mindless titans to her. We also later figure out that the female titan can take in parts of other titans and manifest those titans' abilities herself, a pretty insane ability reminiscent of Tamaki's manifest quirk from My Hero Academia. Because of this ability, according to Annie, the military made her choke down all kinds of things. We also know that Annie was the first to form a nearly indestructible crystal around her actual body. Now, as we'll see when we get to the Warhammer Titan, the Tiber sister was able to form a similar crystal around herself. Is it something all Titan shifters can learn to do? Did Annie eat a part of the Warhammer Titan at some point and learn to do it from that? And is it a coincidence that the only two users who have used it were female Titan shifters? All of these questions remain. However, we do know that this crystal is so strong that the only known way to break through it up to this point is by using the Jaw Titan's insanely powerful claws or jaw. And that about covers it for the female titan. She had great endurance and, when on the island, could run all the way to the outer wall, while carrying Reiner and Bertolt. It exhausted her, but the fact that she was able to do it by herself when originally she was supposed to switch every so often with Marcel's jaw titan shows how impressive her endurance can be when it has to be. And Annie's version is most likely more powerful than past users because of her impressive martial arts skills that she can really make use of with her titan form and hardening abilities. And a lot of people wonder about this, but unfortunately we still don't know what would happen if a male user tried to inherit a female titan power. Next, we have the Card Titan aka the Quadrupedal Titan, meaning it travels around on all fours. It is only 4 meters in height and its only known user is the Warrior Peak Finger. When compared to the other Titan powers, the Card Titan stands out for its unusually high endurance that makes it well suited for long missions. She can maintain her Titan form for at least 2 months straight. Since the user doesn't need to regularly change back into their human form, it's possible for armaments and or cargo to be equipped to the Cart Titan. You could attach armor or carry a firing squad on you, or even an anti-Titan artillery cannon. For these reasons, it's one of the most versatile Titan powers. The Cart Titan is also known for its speed, like the Jaw Titan. Its speed allowed Peak to save Zeke from Levi and Reiner from Hanji. The fact that it was fast enough to catch both of these seasoned soldiers off guard and then get away is remarkable. We have also seen Peak release Focus Steam in her Titan form, which saved her from Jean's Thunder Spear. Notably, Peak's version of the Cart Titan is one of the few Titans that is capable of speech. This may or may not have to do with her intelligence, which she is well known for. Peak was actually chosen for the Cart Titan because of her strong judgment. However, there are significant drawbacks to this Titan power. It doesn't have a strong defense. As Gabby points out, the Cart Titan isn't as tough as some of the others, and the user's body takes longer to repair from damage. Furthermore, because the Titan form tends to be used for such long periods of time, Peak loses the ability to walk on two feet. She's seen crawling on the floor after she gets back from her mission on Paradise Island, and as she's adjusting to walking on two feet again, she needs the support of crutches. Last we saw, Peak was possibly mortally wounded on the back of Eren's giant skeletal Titan. Eren manifested the Tiber Sister version of the Warhammer Titan and had it stab the Card Titan with a trident. Peak did not get off the giant Titan with Reiner, Mikasa, and the others. So if she doesn't die, it is possible that she'll get absorbed by Eren like Zeke was. This absorption may not be permanent, but it is possible that the next time the Survey Corps and Warriors fight Eren, he'll be able to use Armin's Colossal Titan and Peak's Cart Titan against them, just as he used Zeke's Beast Titan before. 
And next we got the already mentioned Warhammer Titan, which was possessed by the Tiber sister before Eren inherited the power. The Warhammer Titan was especially hyped because it was the last one of the nine powers to be introduced to us, and it was definitely worth the wait. The Warhammer Titan's design is reminiscent of a medieval knight's armor, which gives it a very cool look. Beyond that, it can use its hardening powers to form different kinds of weapons, like a sword, a trident, or the signature Warhammer. Beyond that, the Titan can form spikes from the ground or from its body, the spikes can be small enough to just slow an enemy Titan down, or large enough to lift them into the air. But to me, the most impressive thing about this Titan is that it can form more complicated and flexible weapons, like a crossbow or a cattle nine tails whip that can destroy buildings with one swing. It's clearly ridiculously strong, but that strength comes at a price. As Magath explains, although the power of the Warhammer is immense, it is quickly exhausted, and so one strategy for for defeating it is to make it use its special hardening abilities as much as possible. The other power that makes it near undefeatable is its ability to be operated remotely. As we saw with the Tiber sister, she didn't actually have to be in the nape of her titan. She operated it while the real body was safely encased in a titan crystal underground. The titan body is connected to a cable that is connected to the user's titan crystal. This pretty much means that if you can't break through the crystal, you can't win. And the only known way to break through such a crystal is by using the jaws or claws of the jaw titan. So it is very lucky for Eren that Porco's jaw titan was present during that fight, so that Eren could inevitably use him as a nutcracker to gain the Warhammer Titan power for himself. Currently in the manga, Eren and Amir Fritz are summoning past titan shifters in the same way that the Tiber sister summoned her own Warhammer Titan, but they're just doing so on a much much bigger scale. Next up we have the Beast Titan which is currently 17 meters tall. For this one you have to talk about specific users when talking about its power because we now know it's not always an ape-like titan. It can take on the appearance of many different animals including an alligator, a deer, or even a flying creature. It just so happens that Zeke's version, the one that we are most familiar with, takes the form of an ape. We do know that Tom Xaver was the holder of the Beast Titan before Zeke. He was a researcher and father figure to Zeke. They would often play catch, which is fitting when you consider Zeke's Titan and its impressive throwing abilities. We never saw Tom's Beast Titan, so we don't know for sure what animal powers he had, but we do know that his Beast Titan wasn't too useful in war. So when it came time for the royal blooded Zeke to inherit the Beast Titan from Tom, Marley must have felt like they really hit the jackpot. Unlike Tom's Titan, Zeke's Beast Titan was very, very useful in battle. The Marleyan military states that Zeke's Titan's pitching assault is an unprecedented, awe-inspiring weapon. Zeke's Titan can crush rocks in his hands and throw them with deadly accuracy. These rocks can destroy buildings, ships, and easily wipe out a charging army. We know he effortlessly beat Reiner's armored titan when the latter tried to challenge him on Paradise Island, which is crazy to think about considering Tom's version wasn't even useful in battle. But even more impressive is the ability that the Marleyan military called a miracle, namely Zeke's ability to turn people into titans using his spinal fluid and then to control them. With a scream, he can turn these victims into titans, and this ability has been used by Marley to fill enemy areas with countless destructive titans. For instance, they dropped many Eldians over Fort Slava, and then Zeke used his scream to turn them into titans in mid-air. So when they hit the ground, they would cause devastating damage. The fact that Zeke can then control these titans, albeit not perfectly, makes him all the more deadly and very, very useful in war. Like many other titans, Zeke's titan can use selective hardening. And unlike most titans, Zeke can talk in his titan form. In a data book, Zeke's beast titan also got an 11 out of 10 in intelligence, so his insane abilities are combined with his insane intellect and together they make for a very formidable titan shifter. Lastly we got the jaw titan and its four known users that we'll get into. I saved one of the best and most interesting titan powers for last as you'll see. The jaw titan is usually around 5 meters tall. It's small compared to the others, but it makes up for it with insanely powerful jaws, claws, and great speed. And there may not be anything 
sharper and more powerful in the world of Attack on Titan than the jaws and claws of the jaw titan. As I mentioned previously in this video, we don't know of anything else that could break through the titan crystals that Annie and the Tiber sister were able to create around their bodies, except the jaws and claws of the jaw titan. This is why Aaron had to use Porco's titan as a titan nutcracker so he could absorb the Warhammer titan. The first known user of the jaw titan was Marcel Galliard, the older brother of Porco Galliard. Marcel's jaw titan was very similar to Porco's as both had visible hardening on their face and significantly hardened claws. Marley entrusted the jaw titan, which they called an assault unit, to Marcel because he was quick-witted. Marley further called it the swiftest titan and said its powerful claws and jaws could crush just about anything. And I said this in my Porco's jaw titan explained video, but what I'm curious about is if the Marleyan military knows about an exception, about anything that its jaws and claws can't crush, because I'd be super interested in knowing that. The fact that they use the words just about anything rather than anything makes me think they know of something, but it could be me just reading too much into it. Marcel's jaw titan in particular was seen effortlessly destroying cannons with its claws and jaws. Then there's Emir of the Survey Corps, not to be confused with Emir Fritz, the founder. Emir is the second known user of the jaw titan. She inherited it from Marcel after the latter pushed Reiner to safety. Marcel sacrificed his life to save Reiner from Emir's mindless titan, and that's the only reason why Emir didn't end up with the armor titan power instead. Instead. Emir's jaw titan was also known as the dancing titan. It had an easy time climbing walls and trees. Its chimpanzee-like body made it easier for her to outmaneuver anyone in a forest, but the small body meant that she was easily overpowered when outnumbered by attacking titans in an open area. Notably, Emir's titan was able to speak, although not as well as Zeke's and Peek's. And unlike Marcel's and Porco's versions, it didn't have the noticeably hardened face and claws. Emir eventually willingly allowed Reiner to take her to Marley, where Porco Galliard ended up inheriting her Titan power. As I explained in my Porco's Jaw Titan video, Aaron and Mikasa noticed that Porco's version was significantly faster than Emir's version of the Jaw Titan. It fared very well against Aaron's attack Titan in Marley, but since Aaron had help from Levi and then Mikasa, Porco didn't have a chance of winning the battle. He did, however, effortlessly bite through Eren's hardened fists and even break through the Tiber Sisters' Titan Crystal, a detail that never ceases to impress me. Eventually on Paradise Island, a very injured Porco gave himself over to be eaten by Falco Grice, after the latter was turned into a mindless Titan by Zeke's scream. Falco's version of the Jaw Titan is probably the most hyped up Titan of all in the manga right now. From the beginning, there was foreshadowing that Falco would become a flying Titan. When he was introduced, he was reaching out for a bird, and his name itself is a reference to a bird. However, when the ninth Titan turned out to be the Warhammer Titan, people stopped talking about the idea of a flying Titan as much. However, somehow we ended up getting the flying titan we all wanted, although it took longer than we thought it would and didn't actually happen in quite the same way. In the latest chapter, we finally saw our first fully realized flying titan and it was Falco. He had a beak, huge wings, and was big enough to carry quite a few people on his back as he moved speedily through the air. We can assume that he still has powerful jaws and claws, and that he's super fast, as is characteristic of the Jaw Titan. But his is also very unique from any other Jaw Titan version we've seen before. Like a Beast Titan, he's gained animal powers, namely that of a bird. Why would a Jaw Titan gain animal powers, you might ask? Well, it's because Falco was turned into a Titan using Zeke's spinal fluid. And so as Gabby explained, he's showing characteristics of the Beast Titan. Like the female Titan, he can manifest the abilities of another Titan. And this is not that far-fetched, since certain Titan powers like hardening and the Titan screaming abilities have appeared in different Titan shifters in different ways. Titan powers definitely seem to be more fluid than we at first thought. And that's every single one of the 20 Titan Shifters, and you can see now why it makes sense to discuss all of them, because there can be such a big difference between different users of the same Titan power. As I previously mentioned in this video, Emir did summon countless more past Titan Shifters on Eren's skeletal Titan back. We don't know enough about these to discuss them in detail here, but it was fun seeing so many interesting Titan designs, including what looked like an alligator Titan, a reindeer Titan, a fantastic 
Fantastic Four Thing Titan, a Long Necked Dinosaur Titan, and many more. If you would like to see more of these interesting Titan Shifter designs, I strongly recommend you go through chapter 135 of the manga and take your time to examine them in further detail. But as far as this video goes, that is it. Thank you so much for watching and staying tuned until the end. I'm sure this will end up being a very long video. If you did enjoy it, I would really appreciate it if you Warhammer smash that like button. Really destroy it because these kinds of videos take a lot of time. And if you smash that like button, that will let me know that you guys want to keep seeing these kinds of Attack on Titan videos. If you haven't, be sure to subscribe and this is crucial. Hit that notification bell and select all or you will miss future Attack on Titan videos. If you haven't yet, make this the day you subscribe. And while you wait for the next video to drop, feel free to check out my growing Attack on Titan playlist where we got videos about the Ackermans and all their powers, the Titans rank from weakest to strongest, and much, much more. Link to that is in the description. And I especially want to thank the Patreon squad over on Patreon and here on YouTube who helped make videos like this one possible. First and foremost, I want to thank the Patron of Legend, the one acknowledged by Lord Twigo himself, and the most donated champion of the world, Alpha Sigma. And are the one tier patrons, the ones who stand atop all clans, Ingrata, The World, Acquire Respect, Liam Thompson, Pate Hefa, Ruthian, Phoenix Anime, 987, Emperor Otaku, Thomas Jones, Spidey Life Tanel, Baked Buddhist, Tungsten Tarkus, and Denki Kaminari. And our Pro Hero tier patrons, the one and only Gilgamesh, Steelers, Angel Cruz, Anatoly Kazatsky, Cricket XP, Joe Stanton, Barry Gucci, Jessica Kayla Font, Alicia Actor, Bonnie Parks, Hinokami and Water, The Red Haired Raven, Florian, Joanne Garcia, Jack Watches Anime, Fat Boy Games, Manwa Freaks, Deadly Saint, Matthew Cruz, and Anthony Schreiber. Thank you all so much. If you do enjoy our work, you can support more of it by going over to patreon.com slash anime uproar and becoming a patron today for as little as one dollar if you do so you'll get your name featured in future videos alongside these amazing people right here and you'll even get access to our private patron only discord where we talk about anime life and of course thank memes so check out patreon.com slash anime uproar link in the description if you're interested you can also join the youtube channel by clicking the blue join button next to the subscribe button that you've hopefully already destroyed so yeah you can support more content that way if you prefer Whichever way you choose to support us, you can get the same great benefits. Thanks again, and until next time, see ya, Space Cowboys!